All right, welcome back everybody to the Parsha Review. We are on Parsha's Naso. Naso is the second portion in the book of Numbers, Bamidbar. And it is the 35th portion since the beginning of the Torah. As we know, there are 54 portions in the entire Torah. And this is number 35 of those 54. There are 176 verses. Interesting, it is the longest portion in the Torah. Do you know that there's a book of Talmud? The longest book of Talmud is 176 pages. Very good. Very good. Um, and that is the book of Baba Basra, also 176 pages. Uh, but there are 2,264 words, 8,632 letters. If you see that's on the top, right on the top. Right? So the question is. Why do we every week, at almost ad nauseum, repeat the amount of letters, words, and verses? Because there's not one extra and there's not one missing. That's correct. Not one extra letter in the Torah. Every letter that's in the Torah needs to be there. And if it's not there, there's a reason for it. The Torah is not like you read a book and uh, Tom Clancy or whoever the going... Uh, uh, to bestseller today is um, they write words at leisure, whatever they want to express their, themselves. The Torah is God's document. Just like his creation is perfect, his Torah is perfect. There's not one word missing, not one word extra. So, there are 18 mitzvahs in this week's Torah portion. There's seven performative mitzvahs and 11 prohibitions. This portion still talks, like we did last week, about the encampment around the tabernacle. So we begin. In the United States, or outside of Israel, this parsha is always the parsha after, or that follows Shavuot. Bamidbar is always the one that precedes Shavuot. Okay? In Israel, it's not the case. In Israel, they already read Parshas Naso, Last Shabbos, they're one ahead of us. Because if you remember, the last day of Pesach for us was Shabbos. By them, it wasn't Pesach already, because they only have one day of Pesach. So they already read that week's Torah portion. We were still reading a holiday Torah reading. The following week, they're the next week's Torah portion, and we're reading. So we're one at the end of the book of Numbers, Matos Mase, we're going to catch up. We're going to do a double portion there. So we talk about this Torah portion begins with the distribution of responsibilities and recounting of the people. What are the distributions of the responsibilities? The Torah assigns the exact Mishkan-related tasks to be performed by the families of Gershon, Kos, and Merari, the sons of Levi. You remember last week we mentioned that some of those tasks, for example, the carrying of the, the, the menorah was done specifically by the family of Kos. That was their responsibility. That was their task, and they were the only ones who were allowed to deal with the menorah. Uh, other parts were dealt with by other family members. Gershon, Kahas, and Merari, the three sons of Levi, they had different distribution of responsibilities regarding the Mishkan. A census, a census, another census is taken. Remember, the book of Numbers is called the book of Numbers because of the numbers of the counting of the Jewish people. So we'll see numerous times throughout this book of Numbers that the Jewish people are being counted. In this case here, um, the census reveals that over 8,000 men were ready for such service in the temple. This was another counting. Okay, purification of the camp, holiness. What is holiness? Anybody know what holiness is? Holiness, many people think, when you think of something holy, you, 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 well, many times we think it means solitude or distanced from. It means connection. Right? You know that. You've been to a class or two. So holiness means that you're able to connect to godliness. One is able to connect to godliness. It's not that you're isolated and distanced from. On the contrary, it's that you're able to take the things around you and elevate them. 
So we defined it in one of our classes. We talked about holiness. We spent a lot of time talking about it. But all those ritually impure are to be sent out of the encampments. Okay, so if we are a community and there are people who are impure, them being in the community would be an impurity for everyone there. So therefore you send them out. You send them out of the camp. They shouldn't be among the other people. This is an interesting thing, because you might think in our society that we're in today, well, if you're holy, you leave. <laughs> That's the chutzpah we have in our generation, right? It's like, if, if I have a problem, if I'm not the problem, you're the problem that you don't have the problem. Okay? Interesting world we're living in. But either way, the Torah tells us that when someone has this impurity, they have to leave the camp. I will tell you that um, Rabbi Brody was recently in Houston, and as righteous people do, they go to the mikvah as frequently as they can. Now, men are able to use a swimming pool as a mikvah. So we had the privilege of having Rabbi Brody use our pool in our home as his mikvah. Chlorine dust. Uh, chlorine dust, definitely. Uh, but but it, it's not, it's because there's no biblical obligation for a man to use a mikvah. There's only a biblical commandment for a woman to use a mikvah. In such case, a woman cannot use a pool-like ritual bath. A man can, except if it was one of the biblical contaminations, like the Mitzorah, that would not suffice to be in a swimming pool. That would need an actual ritual bath uh, that is a biblically uh, permitted ritual bath. And all you, all you do, this is an interesting sum, a sidebar, if we're already talking about the mikvah, the mikvah would entail, for anyone using a mikvah, that there be no barrier between you and the water. That means if I had a ring or a watch on my hands or a bathing suit on me, that would be a barrier or known in, in the halacha term as a chatzitza something which is a barrier between skin the skin and the water. So you have everything removed. And a woman who goes to the mikvah, which is a biblical commandment, they make sure that there's no nail polish. They make sure that there are no hairs that are knotted together. They make sure that their nails are cut, that their everything is, right? So they don't go with a fresh coat of nail polish. And no makeup. All of it is clean, clean. Then they go into the into the mikvah. Um, I realized yesterday when I went to the mikvah on Yom Tif, uh, I said, "Let me try also." So I went into and I realized I have in my mouth, as many of you can possibly hear, but you for sure know it from being a, a listening to a class or two. I'm I'm currently in the middle of the Invisalign process, so these are removable aligners, and therefore they would constitute a barrier in a mikvah. What do they do? They straighten my teeth. Because they're not permanent. Mm -hmm. So I, I took them out. I remembered after dipping seven times that I that I was uh now what a very interesting thing. When I went to the Arizal's mikvah, and the Arizal's mikvah is in Tzfat, it's it's yeah. it is freezing cold. It is so cold. Cool. But you can't not do it because like everyone's like just dunking into this freezing cold mikvah, you can't be that guy who's like, I'm from Houston and I'm freezing and I can't, right? You just got to go. So I went to the Arizal's mikvah and I would dunk myself in once and there's a guy over there saying, come on, another time, another time, another time, another 13 times. There's a Kabbalistic reason behind the number 13, 13 attributes of mercy. So when someone does use the mikvah, typically the custom is to go to dunk 13 times. Now you can dunk 13 times by just keeping your head on the water, putting your hand finger up 13 times. And that's perfect because it's out, in, out, in. The idea also is that your whole body is consumed by this body of water and becoming pure like that water. Just like this water is holy, now that you're part of it, so if you have hair sticking out on above the water, or on the surface of the water, that's not that's not good enough. Everything has to be beneath the water line, completely consumed by the water. 
No, you don't want to stay on the tour. Right. So that's about um, ritual impurity and purification. The idea is, is that when a, when a woman comes up, when a man comes up from that water, they are coming out pure, clean, without any of the impurities that they had prior to going, to, going into that water. It's interesting how baptism is similar in that they've, they've stolen this concept from Judaism, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have to stay a very long time, at least in the movies. Actually. Stay what? Under the under water. water. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, they dunk them under and they say your prayer and everything, and then they say all sorts of other things. Sometimes you can drown. All right. Well, they didn't take that from us. So either way, false oaths, repenting for theft, debts. So here we go. If a person, after having sworn in court to the contrary, confesses that he wrongly retained his neighbor's property, he has to pay an additional fifth of the base price of the object and bring a guilt offering as atonement. So let me ask you a question. Do you have a watch? Oh, it's a nice watch. All right? So imagine I come over to, what did you say your name was again? For, Fernando. Fernando, right? So I go over to Fernando and I say, hey, how you doing? I grab his watch. He doesn't realize. I put it in my pocket. And I'm like, hey, Fernando, it's great to see you. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, I walk off with his watch. He says, hey, sister's dead. He stole my watch. Well, I didn't steal your watch. All right? They take me to court. Of course, I said, I did not steal your watch. And then I have two kosher witnesses here, and they say, uh, Rabbi, we saw you steal the watch. I'm like, I didn't steal the watch. So if it's just a, a an item, you have to pay double. You get two Apple Watches now. Ooh, not bad, right? <laughs> you have to get two. If there are witnesses, okay. But what happens if I steal an animal? I steal an animal. And you know what I did? I didn't keep the animal inside my pen, inside my uh, <laughs> barn. I slaughtered the animal. Now you have no proof it's gone. Witnesses come and they say, we saw you steal it. We saw you slaughter it. Now you know what you have to pay? Depending on the type of animal, either four or five of those animals. Tavach or machar, if he slaughtered it or he sold it to somebody else right so you don't have a uh, a uh, vin number on the animal there's no vin number that's why people brand it. they do they put on their ears or whatever they put mm -hmm. so, right but someone goes and sells it now we will say that you have my animal i don't have your animal. i bought it from that guy right so now you're basically flipping the item or getting or, or getting rid of the evidence you pay four or five depending on the type of animal hefty punishment but but what happens if he admits his guilt if what he admits his guilt before they say you're guilty he says oh before i want to your honor your honor i was just kidding i was just kidding i lied and i wasn't saying the truth right so it depending on what the case is he just has to return the item and he doesn't have that penalty right because um the talmud teaches us that someone who is admitting to guilt doesn't pay the extra penalty right 20 percent me right okay what what are you saying i don't think that makes any sense why well steal some things that I stole. Okay, wait, 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 one second. You want to create a culture where people want to say the truth. There'll be a penalty if you don't say the truth. The problem today is that if it's less than 950 bucks, you can you can smash and grab anything you want in Los Angeles, in California. There's not right. They're not going to uh, they're not going to pursue any theft of less than 950 dollars. You know that. That's craziness. That's not what you're saying. No, it's California. What? That's not what they're saying. No, I'm not saying this. Well, um, even today, all over the country, if you plea bargain and admit your guilt up front, 
you get a reduced sentence. Right. Right. I mean, that's the, it is to incentivize not have, putting the state through a trial and bothering everybody right. and taking but, up time, et cetera. Right. But there is a problem also that in that people are admitting to things that they're not guilty of, but they just don't want to deal with it, so they'll admit it. That's not either truthful. Meaning, I didn't speed, but I'll say that I sped just so that I don't get, you know, or that, or they'll say, okay, we're going to move this to a non-moving violation, to a parking ticket. Right. But, but that's they not either true. Down. They plead down. They plead, but that's not either true. But the net result is a reduced penalty for saving everybody the time and trouble. Right, but is it truthful? No, but it's okay. But it's okay. So, but it's agreeable. I understand. I understand. Trial and they were found guilty in the trial, and it looked like they were all jurors in the trial court or whatever. You know, then you could end up, you know, paying. It might the outcome might end up being worse. So it's basic. It's basic I I, I understand. Compromise doesn't mean truth. We have to remember that. But it means peace. It means, means peace. peace. Okay, that's why. We see that many times Hashem says, I'm willing to give up on truth, even though Hashem emet, Hashem's name is truth, I'm ready to give up on that for you to have peace. I'm ready to give up on that for peace, and we'll see that in a minute. We'll see that Hashem is willing to give up for the sake of peace. We'll see. An amazing. If the claimant has already passed away without ears, the payments are made to a Kohen. So if you owe someone money, and that person dies and you have no one to pay it to, who do you pay it to? Pay it to the coin, the priest. And the priest um, added it to his stash. Okay, next, Sota, the adult, the suspected adulteress. Um, in certain circumstances, a hum, husband who suspects that his wife had been unfaithful brings her to the temple. And he goes to the front of the Bedin, the court, and he says, Court, my wife has been unfaithful to me. So the they obviously they interrogate her and they try to persuade. You have to remember that when they come in front of court, the court always tries to beg for them to repent. Beg for them to admit. We don't want to do this to you. We don't want to hurt you. We don't want to have a an example. Ah, oh, we caught you, right? We don't want to catch you. We want you to be to go home and, and do the just do the right thing. So the coin prepares a drink of water mixed with the dust from the temple floor and a special ink that was used for inscribing God's name on a piece of parchment. So what happens is they write Hashem's name and then they take that parchment and put that parchment into the water. That ink dissolves into that water and now you have this potion that she's going to drink. If she is innocent, the potion does not harm her. Rather, it brings a blessing of beautiful children, of great children. And if she is guilty, she suffers a supernatural death. That her stomach will explode and she will... Not pleasant. Okay? They don't punish her husband if she's found well, he's not, never allowed to divorce her after that. <laughs> that, might, that might be a punishment, right? <laughs> he's gonna have to. He's gonna have to live at her being innocent, right? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but um, yep. Yeah. Good question. Well, we do have something similar in that in the, in the reverse, which is if the husband suspects his wife, not suspect, sorry, if he accuses his wife the day after they get married, he accuses her of not having her virginity. So he brings her to court and then it turns out that he was just lying. So he has to pay the father I think it's 50 gold coins. A lot of money. And why? For for accusing him of raising a daughter who's not uh, not, a, not a faithful woman. 
and he's never allowed to divorce her. That's possible. No, no kids in that. Right. Yeah. You had a question? I was just thinking, like, is that, isn't there a similar situ situation with David Amalek? And, like, he he has got to, like, put him to a test, and he's going after, like, having an extramarital relation with somebody else's wife. And, I don't know. I feel like there's some kind of lines between there. I, I, well, we could talk about it at a different time. We're, we could focus on, on King David and all that. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a story that very, very different than how it reads out you have to understand there's a whole nother layer to it okay next is the nazirite the nazir the nazir is one a nazir is one who vows to dedicate himself to god for a specific period of time he must abstain from all grape products grow his hair and avoid contact with corpses so keep himself holy keep him abstain from everything at the end of this period, he shaves his head and brings a special offering. So the question is, here's someone who wants to connect. Here's someone who wants to do something special. He wants to elevate himself to a whole new level. He feels that he, and what does he do? He disconnects from everything physical, right? He doesn't get a nice haircut, lets his hair go, grow. He doesn't drink any wine. He stays away from that, and he avoids contact with dead people. And then when he's done, he shaves his head off and he brings an offering. What does he bring an offering for? To atone for his sins. What was his sins? Uh, abstaining from pleasures. So oh, there you go. It's a sin. God doesn't want us to abstain from pleasure. God wants us to enjoy this world. And if someone unilaterally decides on their own that they are going to limit themselves that's a sin onto its own god does not want that and therefore you have to bring special offering okay very good priestly blessing what's that it's not it's not a sin it's just it's something that you need to atone for so to speak it's not it, it's it's it it's a sometimes it's a necessary evil Okay, sometimes you have to do certain things. You gotta, you gotta limit yourself. You, you're in a, uh, okay. Dedication, discipline, that type of stuff. If someone is in a situation, okay, a guy goes to Vegas, okay, and he's being caught up by his temptation. He says, you know what? I'm a nazir. I'm gonna protect myself. I'm not gonna get drunk in the bar. I'm not gonna, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna protect myself. He locks himself in. It is that way. He says, I can't, I can't do any of those terrible things, right? Because I swore that I'm going to, I'm going to be a Nazir. Right? He did it for a good reason, for a holy reason. But still, God doesn't want you to, 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 to so you bring an offering. Sometimes you have to do it. Okay? So now well, here's the big question. Here's the very, very big question. And this Rashi asks this question. Every one of the sages deal with this question. My grandfather talked about this many, many times. Why is there a juxtaposition between the portion of the Sota and the portion of the Nazarite? Why are they one next to each other? One is right next to the other. One second. I don't believe it. We're doing the wrong parsha. <laughs> I just realized we're doing the wrong parsha. No, no, sorry, 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 sorry. I'm in the wrong Sorry, we are parshas now. I'm in the wrong. I was in the wrong komish. Was the wrong book. Sorry. Everyone has one of those days, don't they? Please tell me they do. Always, always. Okay. It's comforting to know you make mistakes. I do. If I make plenty. Like plenty. Okay, here we go. So here we go. So here uh, we in. Okay, in chapter five, the end of chapter chapter five, we talk about the woman, the wayward woman, 
And then we go to the beginning of chapter 6. We start to talk about the Nazarite. Obvious question Rashi asks right away. Lama nismacha parshas nazir le parsha soto. Why is the portion of the nazir immediately juxtaposed after the portion of the wayward woman? What does one have to do with the other? Lama lecha says Rashi. Shikola ro es soto bikilkula yazir atzmo menayayin. It's from the Talmud. Whoever sees a woman in her destruction should immediately remove himself from wine. You know, there's a fundamental principle we've spoken about many, many times. And that is, there's nothing random. There's not. If you saw something, you were supposed to see it. It's supposed to be a message for you. You saw a woman on trial for such an abuse, for such a, an, an allegation. Guess what? It's a message. You know what that message is? That message is protect yourself. Do you know how she got into her situation? Do you know that she, how she was accused of having an, an adulterous affair? Not by herself. She got drunk. She went to a party. She went to a bar. And some guy, you know, yeah. You know? She receives. That's how things happen. You know what? Immediately after, it talks about, about, the, about the Nazir. Remove yourself from wine. You stay away from wine. It's a message. When you see someone, God forbid, we should never ever know of such things. But if you see a news story of someone who's drunk driving, shouldn't that be a lesson? Shouldn't that be a lesson for every person to be extra cautious? <clears throat> that if someone is to drink even a little sip of wine, a little a little shot, a little l'chaim. Give your keys to somebody else. Be responsible. There's, you're saying over-consuming versus alcoholism, right? Um, there's, there's a big difference. There are people who are alcohol dependent. They need it. I had someone once stay in my house for a little while, and they said to me, "Every time I pass by your bar, I want, I want to, I feel, I, I have this urge. I want to take, I want to take something to drink. That's not good. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. Person, once in a while, at the end of your day, when you just enjoy a nice sip of wine or some, that's something that's different. But that you need it every time. Something wrong. But we're not talking about that." There are messages being sent our way constantly. And we keep pushing them away. We keep pushing them away. We have to take that message, just like the Nazir. He saw, if someone were to see a Sota, you see the hearing, the court case of a Sota, of a wayward woman. What's the wake-up call? The wake-up call, it's time to protect yourself. Take a protective measure. And be proactive in finding yourself a way to avoid getting into such a situation. Okay, the priestly blessings from the Kohanim. The Kohanim had the right to give a blessing. However, they themselves don't bless the people. The commandment is, Their job is to put God's name on them, and God will bless them. They're not given special powers to give that blessing. You put my name on the Jewish people and I will bless them, says God. We, it's a known thing. We, we, we mentioned last week there's no equality, right? We, we mentioned that in the Parsha class. There's no equality. This idea of equality doesn't exist in Judaism. The Kohen had certain privileges that the Levi didn't have. And the Levi had certain privileges that the Israel didn't have. And the Israel had certain privileges that they that the Kohen and Levi didn't have. Everyone was unique. They're different. They're different. They're not the same. There's no equality. Everyone is special in their own way. Everyone has to find their way. See, there's a difference between saying everyone has opportunity and lift people up versus pull people down to try to make equality. We're going to pull you down. 
You're successful. We're going to take away your money. We're going to tax you more. Evil corporations. We're going to see that soon in the portion of Korach. The Koranim had special privileges in that they were able to put Hashem's name on the people so Hashem can bless them. Just yesterday was Shavuot, the holiday of Shavuot, and only on the festivals do the Ashkenazic community and the Ashkenazic synagogues, the priestly blessings are only during the festivals. So Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot are times where the priests, uh, the Kohanim, they go, they wash their hands, the Levites wash their hands, they go in the, in, the, in, in the front of the congregation at the end of the Musaf repetition, and they recite the blessing to bless the Jewish people, and they say the blessing uh, on the people. Again, it's a special privilege that they put God's name on the people, and Hashem is the one who blesses them. And the last part of the portion is Mishkan dedication. The Mishkan is completed and dedicated on the first day of Nisan and the second year after the Exodus. The prince of each tribe makes a communal gift to help transport the Mishkan, as well as donating identical individual gifts of gold, silver, animals, and meal offerings. Now, you'll remember we spoke about this back in the, at the end of Exodus, that you had the Nisi'im. What's the Nisi'im? The leaders of each tribe. Very good. The leaders of each tribe. The leaders of each tribe. They were wealthy people. They were like the, the governors, let's call them the governor of each tribe. They're successful people, financially. They did well. They were able to donate what regular lay people weren't able to. So they said, you know what? Let the people donate wherever they can. And we'll donate whatever's left over. There was nothing left in. They well, there were there were things left over, the gems from the breastplate, which were very expensive, the most expensive. But God saw what was in their heart. And what it was in their heart was a little bit of laziness. Because someone who wants to do a mitzvah jumps to do the mitzvah. Someone who doesn't want to do the mitzvah sits back and waits and gives excuses and gives reasons and this and that because, because, because. But it's not real. It's not Maybe real. He was doing a negative mitzvah. What? Maybe he was doing a negative mitzvah. What do you mean? Like he was not. He was instead of doing. He wasn't doing the the, the proactive, the the positive mitzvah. Yeah, he was being lazy about transgressing. We he have an opportunity to donate to the temple. I know oh. you're trying to judge favorably. Oh, my okay. Oh, <laughs> but Hashem didn't. So Hashem knows what's in the heart. And Hashem. Right. Well, Hashem saw that they were using a little bit of laziness in that. So Hashem, in their name, he took out the letter Yud, which is Hashem's name. He took out the letter Yud, and the word Nisim is missing the Yud. Because Hashem says, I don't want to be associated with those who are lazy, or those who are delaying in doing my commandments. When you have an opportunity to do a commandment, do it right away. So, my dear friends, have an amazing Shabbos. Now, Wednesday night, which is really Thursday already. Sorry, Tuesday night, which is already Wednesday, right? Because Shabbos lasts Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the aura of Shabbos. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is already the new Shabbos come, kicking in. So the halacha says you can already wish someone a good Shabbos from Wednesday. And because tonight is already Wednesday, now that, it, that the sun is set, therefore, I wish you all a good Shabbos. Yes. So what offering is a 